we have been looking at that first advent through the lens of um, Joseph's eyes. Joseph, not the Old Testament Joseph, but Joseph, the one who had the, that unbelievable privilege of being Jesus' earthly father. You know, on first glance, as we observe Joseph, it appears as though he's in the shadows. Kind of one of the, kind of the outside the picture, if you're going to take a family pic, he'd be in the, he'd be in the shadow in the back. But when you look more closely, under closer examination, Joseph may be more significant than we originally thought. Some of the most practical lessons from that first advent, and the advent just simply means arrival, that Jesus came, uh, God uh, squeezed his life into humanity and was born of flesh and lived among us. And so no longer did we have an excuse. Now we know what God looks like. Not physically looks like, but his character, his attributes are all encompassed in this perfect, this perfect person. Some of the most practical lessons of that first advent are gleaned as we look at the life of Joseph. He's a lot like us, minding his own business, doing his job. He's even called faithful, so he's a little bit above average. Good guy. Then God interrupts Joseph's life, an interruption he wasn't looking for and didn't necessarily want. The young woman he was engaged to reveals that she's pregnant. Just like any of us, based upon what Joseph knows and what we know about reproduction, the only possibility is that Mary has had relations with another man. Uh, like Joseph, God interrupts our life all the time. He uses circumstances outside of our control, could be uh, job loss, maybe a birth defect, maybe a tragic accident, maybe a loved one dies. Maybe your child graduates and moves away from you, and it just, man, it, the pain is wrenching. Maybe a physical storm that literally does damage to your property. Crops that just didn't come in. Maybe you want to get pregnant, and you can't get pregnant. Investments that you thought would be a sure deal are lost. Maybe a friend that you counted on turns on you. God allows interruptions for the purpose of stopping us from continuing on our current path. And when we stop, we're then vulnerable to embrace a bigger story. And for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, there is always, always a bigger story outside the smaller story. If you've been around me, it's one of my constant mantras. There is always a bigger story outside the smaller story. And many of the times, we, all we can see is the smaller story. Because we're just thinking horizontal. It's the here and now. It's the tyranny of the urgent. But God is always orchestrating a bigger story outside the smaller story. And once God interrupts our lives with some unwanted circumstance, some unwanted circumstance that at first glance we assume it's a mistake and somebody's got to be blamed, at that point in time we're set up to be intercepted. And Joseph learned that. See, the young woman he was promised to claim she's pregnant by a supernatural act of God. Uh, Joseph has to be thinking, bless her heart, does she expect me to believe this? I mean, this has never happened in the annals of human history. The thought from our human perspective that she's pregnant by a supernatural act of God, come on, that's insanity. It is simply from her perspective, from our horizontal perspective, it's not possible. No one in their right mind is remotely open to such an absurdity. Yet one thing we learn about Joseph, even in the midst of this information, he's driven by his character, not by Mary's hard-to-believe story. And so he does the best he can do based upon what he knows. He thinks, I I'll divorce her in secret yeah, they haven't been married yet, but in that culture, when you are promised to someone, there is still a, um, a legal ceremony you have to go through to separate ties. And so he's thinking, I, I need to divorce her in secret. Maybe, maybe in his goodness, his character, he's thinking, I can protect her from the fallout. Because had she been exposed, it would have been death by stoning. Horrible thought. He respected this young woman. But at this point in time, how do you believe that? 
then God intercepts Joseph's life. He sends him in a different direction. Through an angelic being, God reveals to Joseph the bigger story outside of this smaller story. Joseph wasn't looking for it. He he didn't ask for it. And what Joseph learns is that some of the most profound things that God teaches us, we're not even looking for. And a lot of times, the messages that God has for us are hard to hear. And that's why many times God uses what I want to call mentor messengers. They're not serving themselves, but they're to serve us in our greater purpose, to redirect our steps. By the way, a prerequisite for giving someone else instruction is caring more for them than you do for yourself. God intercepts Joseph, changes his course so that he'll lose his life in a bigger story. The bigger story is for the sake of the gospel. God interrupts us. He changes our course so that we will lose our lives for the sake of the gospel. Joseph, once he is intercepted and his course is redirected, he enters into and starts freely participating in the bigger story. See, whether we realize it or not, our lives were created for the purpose of sending the message of Jesus to places that we will never go. It's called influence. Joseph, as much as anyone else, was used to send the greatest messenger with the greatest message to places that Joseph would never go. And we'll see this morning that Joseph's story continues. I want to look at Matthew chapter 2. I want to start in verses 1 and 2. Starts in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that first Christmas day, In the days of Herod the king, hold on to that thought, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw this star in the east and have come to worship him. Now let me do some commentary and some observation. First observation, not all scholars agree on the timing of the arrival of the Magi from the east. They they apparently came sometime after the birth of Jesus You know, traditions, stories, we see the baby born in this manger and all of a sudden the Magi show up. Probably it was about two years after the fact that um, Mary and Joseph and Jesus received these Magi. We know the circumstances have changed in context here that Mary and Joseph are no longer in this little cave. They're no longer in a manger type scene. They're in a house. It records that in verse 11. And the language that the New Testament authors used was very specific because it says that Jesus was a child, the word Padean. If he was still a baby, they would have used that word. The word for baby is brifos, and so he was a little child. He's probably about two years old. I'll connect the dots here in a second. Second observation here, the exact identity of the Magi is really impossible to determine Though several ideas suggest they were men of high position and they came from an area near Babylon. That would be way east. These men were given special revelation by God about, their, about the birth of Jesus, this Redeemer King, who would bring things back to the way they were intended to be. Um, they were men of high standing. Magi, by definition, they were specialists in astronomy. They studied the stars. They were probably familiar with past prophecies, maybe even with Balaam's prophecy 1,200 years earlier concerning that there would be a star that would somehow be in the area of Jacob. That was kind of a a pseudonym for the fact that Jacob was the father of Israel, and so there would be some star. It was recorded 1,200 years earlier in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. This is what we know for sure about the Magi. They believed... And they came to worship the king. They believed wholeheartedly in what he stood for. Interesting, the Bible never reveals how many there were. We always assume there's three because there were three gifts. Well, it could be three, and I'm fine with that. But if we zone in on the number of the Magi, we're going to miss the meaning of that. I'll connect that dot here in a second. But I want you to understand, it's important for us to understand the political climate in which this all took place. It says, in the days of Herod the king. That's a loaded statement because King Herod was a brutal tyrant. 
He, he murdered his mother-in-law. He murdered his second wife. He murdered three of his own sons. This was the kind of man he was. He was about to add the killing of innocent children to his list. This was a volatile, delicate political climate. Herod was evil and he was unpredictable. You had to understand that when you begin to place, this is the world in which Jesus came. It wasn't this pristine little um, kindergarten, um, just fairy tale. Now let's look at verses 3 through 8. When Herod, the king, heard this, he was troubled. What did he hear? Well, he heard that these magi were in Jerusalem. They were looking for this new king. And so Herod, the king, heard this. He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Verse 4, gathering together all his chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, well, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what would have been written about the prophet. And then... Uh, Matthew quotes what these prophets or what these religious guys knew in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Centuries before Jesus came, it gave the address of where Jesus would be born. And you Bethlehem, land of Judah. This is written hundreds of years before Christ was even born. And it's pigeon holing exactly where he would be born. Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means last among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So then Herod, verse 7, secretly begins to plot. He called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for this child, and when you found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. You know, understanding what we know about King Herod, we can see why he was disturbed when the Magi came to Jerusalem looking for the Redeemer King. They were jealous. <laughs> Herod wasn't the true king. He was not a descendant of David at all. And to be the king sitting on the throne of David, you had to be from David. You had to be from Jacob. Well, Esau, he was from Esau. He was an Edomite. He was a, he was a wannabe. Therefore, he was easily threatened. If someone could be confirmed as a descendant of David, be confirmed as a descendant of Jacob, well, Herod's throne would be in jeopardy. So Herod's thinking this Jesus, this newborn king, had to be destroyed so that Herod could protect his delusional reign. In verse 6, again, it points out, interesting, the prophet that gives the exact location centuries before that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Who knows that? Well, God does, so prophecy is easy for God because he sees everything. He stands outside of time. He sees past, present, future, all as it happens simultaneously. He's everywhere at once. Herod had a plan. Herod has a plan to protect his kingdom. It's to kill this newborn Jesus. And he thought using the Magi would be a great way to find exactly where he's located so he could rid himself of this threat. He's evil. His agenda is evil. He's deceptive. He appeals to them, hey, uh, let me know where you find him so I too can come and worship him. He didn't have worship on his mind. He had murder on his mind. Please understand this. Don't miss this. The advent of Christ is not a sweet little children's G-rated story. It would be if we shut our eyes to the events that turn it into an R-rated story. This is a story of cosmic struggle between good and evil. The advent is a reminder that danger surrounds the coming of Jesus. And danger will always surround representing Jesus. There is a spiritual battle that is fierce. And it's a battle over eternity. It's a battle over who will eternally win over heaven and be in control. And to miss that fact is a grave error of the follower of Christ. There is a battle that rages over the souls of every man, woman, and child. And the reason that Jesus came, he came to set every man, woman, and child free from the bonds of slavery of sin, to destroy evil that has an agenda set against God's creation. See, the evil one 
does everything he can. We know his playbook. He does everything he can to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his agenda. And to leave that part out of the Jesus story turns it into a story it was never intended. See, to understand the Advent, you need to understand the Advent was D-Day. It was the invasion of God into this occupied world of sin and death and despair. And when Jesus came, he declared war on evil. And therefore, it ought to be a reminder to us. It ought to engage us in the, it ought to give us an all-hands-on-deck mentality to, to wake up. We, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are enlisted into the mother of all wars. Every conflict that has ever taken place is a result of this spiritual battle. Every day, people have a choice of which side they side with. And when we choose to side with the evil one who chooses to steal, kill, and destroy, that's where conflict erupts. <laughs> it seems so simple. And yet we just bite on it, the bait of Satan. We just jump on the bandwagon and yeah, this person's evil and this person's evil. And God, when he came, causes us to rise above the bigger story outside the smaller story that he came to do away with that cosmic battle so that once and for all sin could be destroyed and conflict could be no more. That's why they call him the Prince of Peace. You know, if you're a prince of peace, you're coming in to assume there's a war going on and Jesus came to bring peace out of conflict. That's why he came. Look with me at verses 9 through 13. After hearing the king, they, the magi, went their way. And the star, don't miss this, this is really insightful, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. They're in Jerusalem, they're going to Bethlehem, they're traveling south, and a, a, a star is going from north to south leading them. Don't miss that. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Verse 11, after coming into the house, they saw the child, the not baby, was a child, probably about two years old, Jesus, with Mary, his mother. And they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left their own country by another way. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and the mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So the Magi leave Jerusalem. It's about a few hours on foot. It's not very far. It, 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 we could drive to it in five minutes. But by walking distance, it's a few hours on foot. From Jerusalem to Bethlehem, you go from north to south. And this star led these astronomers right to the child. Interesting. Their whole life, get this, their whole life, these magi, they worship the stars. Now God orchestrates it so that the stars point them to the one who is worthy of worship. Probably wasn't a star at all. You see, as the world rotates, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, stars shift from east to west. This star didn't sh shift from east to west. This star traveled from north to to south. Stars don't travel from north to south. Once it reached its location, it didn't shift. <laughs> this wasn't a star at all. It remained fixed. It was the glory of God showing off his son. And the worship heightened as the Magi gave gifts that were only worthy of a king. Maybe three Magi. I've got no problem with that. Three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those are gifts that you only give a king. Only a king's worthy of those gifts. Don't miss the bigger story outside the smaller story because prophecy lets us in on a secret. Here's the bigger story. Someday, all the wealth of all the nations in the world in the end of times will be completely given to the Messiah. It's recorded in Isaiah 60, verses 5 and 11, Isaiah 61, verse 6, Isaiah 66, verse 20, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 10, Haggai chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. All of the nations in the end of times, everything, all 
the world's wealth and riches is presented to Jesus. And so this, these gifts from the Magi were a representation of the wealth that Jesus would one day be honored with. But at that moment, this gold, this gold frankincense, and myrrh were gifts that would be used. They were the means by which Joseph would support his family while living in exile in Egypt. God appears to the Magi in a dream. Go home another way. Herod doesn't have good intentions. Simultaneously, Joseph once again is interrupted by a dream. Flee the country quickly. You know, in total, we will see that Joseph receives four revelations from God, four instructions from God. This character we once thought was in the shadows, you'd be hard-pressed to find another character in the Bible that was as privileged as Joseph. Joseph's story starts with an interruption. Then God intercepts him, sends him in a new direction, and now Joseph experiences God's intervention. God intervenes in Joseph's life, but God intervenes in our life. Why? To provide and protect. And God intervenes in your life on a regular basis to provide and protect, and you don't even see it most of the time. And very seldom do we ever give him credit for. Do you realize that? God intervenes in your life on a constant basis to protect you, to provide you. You, you, you know, the evidence of that is you, you've got an enemy who is fierce, who is stronger than you, who, ca- who says his agenda is to steal, kill, and destroy you. The fact that you are here and you are not destroyed is evidence of the fact that God has protected you and provided for you. He has intervened for you, and he never gets credit for it. God sends us allies to meet the threat of our enemy all the time. Sometimes they're physical, sometimes they're spiritual. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 that our true enemy are not other people. Our true enemy are are spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And and these, uh, these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, what they do is they cause us to turn on each other. You remember when the shepherds, you remember when the shepherds appeared to the, or the angels appeared to the shepherds in the field? You remember that first Christmas night and the shepherds are out in the field manning their stations and all of a sudden this army of angels appears to them singing and then they say, hey, don't be afraid. You remember that? Legion, just kind of shake your head if you remember that. You remember learning that in your Sunday school class? This whole legion, this whole army of angels shows up in this field. Why do you think they showed up? Because you had all these angels in the heavens that had nothing better to do? You know the reason they showed up? Is they showed up to protect the bigger story. God's empowered forces were guaranteeing that the gates of hell would not get the upper hand. See, they were showing up. God is faithful to protect his holdings. Who are his holdings? You and me. And so he sends his armies down at the birth of Christ and says, no, 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 uh uh-uh. The enemy of God is not going to thwart this. There is a battle that wages. Maybe that's why Paul was referring what he was referring to when he wrote Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. He says this, I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor demonic angels nor nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God intervenes to protect and provide and very seldom does he ever get credit for it. One of my favorite Old Testament stories that captures this idea of God's intervention His protection, his provision is captured in this passage. It's kind of in the hidden pages of your Bible in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. You don't have to turn there. Let me just tell you the story. 700 years before Christ came, here's the situation. The Arameans, like Herod, had an evil agenda. They want to destroy the nation of Israel. Elisha was the prophet on the scene. He was God's messenger. If you want to understand history in the Bible, there's three major times where miracles just erupt. 
One is during the time of Moses, another is during the time of Elijah and Elisha, and another is during the time of Jesus. I didn't say that God doesn't do miracles at other times, but those are the three explosions of miracles, Moses, Elijah, and Elisha, and then Jesus. And Elisha is the prophet. He's the messenger of God. Aram is warring against Israel. And the king of Aram becomes enraged because Elisha, because he's got a direct path to God, tells the king of Israel the Arameans' battle plans before the Arameans ever even roll them out. And so every time they go to battle, the Arameans are destroyed by the Israelites because they know their battle plans. And so the king of Aram is furious. He wants to destroy Elisha. If I can destroy Elisha, no longer will they have insight into our battle plans. We'll be able to wipe out the Israelites. So he hears word that Elisha is in Dothan. It's this little city in the middle of Israel, in the middle of nowhere. And so the king of Aram orders his entire army to surround Dothan. So they march in at night and they surround this city of Dothan. It was very early in the morning. The sun is just breaking the crest of the earth. It's an early morning. Elisha shares a little apartment with his steward, his secretary. His name is Gehazi. Gehazi gets up early in the morning, routine morning, just to fetch a pail of water. He goes out to fetch a pail of water in this little city of Dothan. And as he's fetching this pail of water, he looks on the horizon And the city of Dothan is surrounded by horses and chariots and this army of the Arameans. He drops his pail, runs back inside, and says, Master, he says, Master to Elisha, he says, We're in trouble. The army of the Arameans has surrounded us and they have come to kill us. Master, what do we do? This was Elisha's response. Elisha says, Oh Gehazi, don't fear. My prayer for you is that you would be able to see that greater are those with us than those who are with them. Greater are those with us than those who are with them. And Gehazi's thinking, What are you talking about? We are surrounded by the Aramean army, and you're saying greater are those with us than with them? We are toast. And Elisha prays for Gehazi. This is what he prays. Lord, open his eyes that he might see. You know my prayer for you? And not just now, I pray it consistently for you, that your eyes may be open. I, I don't think you're going to physically see God's army. But I want you to see that there's a bigger story outside the smaller story. That God is in control, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. That's what I pray for you constantly. That you'd enter into the bigger story. And if you understood that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, then what you'd you'd worry less. You'd fight less. You'd start living with purpose rather than living under this fear and the tyranny, the urgent, what are we going to do? Oh my gosh. Instead of living in, in fear of failure, you'd live in with the challenge of victory. And so he prays this for Gehazi. So Gehazi walks back outside and God gives Gehazi a great gift. And Gehazi begins to look and he sees this Aramean army, nothing's changed. But then God gives Gehazi this gift that very few people will ever be able to see. He sees the the spiritual realm and beyond the realm of this physical Aramean army that's gathered around Dothan, you know what he sees? He sees angelic beings with chariots on fire surrounding the city of Dothan. I got goosebumps. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So here's what happens. Elisha walks out and says, 
I pray that this army of the Arameans would be blinded. And all of a sudden, they were blinded. They all of a sudden have scales on their eyes. And, and Elisha leads this army right into uh, the king of Israel's main camp. Leads them in there. They're all blind. They're on their horses. And they lead them right into the Israeli army. And, and now the Israeli army is like, well, the Aramean army is right here. And, and then... He opens their eyes and they're open and now all of a sudden they're surrounded by the Israeli army in a very vulnerable situation and Elijah says to him, feed them and then let them go with the instruction never to set foot in our kingdom again. If that happened to you and you were an Aramean soldier, you would never step foot in the Israeli territory again. And they never came back. See, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Fast forward 700 years, that first advent, Joseph is assured through four dreams, greater are the forces with him than Herod's soldier thugs. Fast forward another 2,000 years, and here's the message to us. Greater is he that's in you than the one that's in the world. Do you see? You know, none of us will be gifted probably with ever being able to see in the spiritual realm. But do you see? Helen Keller said worse than being blind is being able to see and yet have no vision. When God intervenes to protect and provide for us, it's for a purpose of reassuring us that the one in us is greater than the one in the world. And you see, that Advent is an invitation to join God in the bigger eternal struggle outside the smaller struggle that we become so preoccupied with. See, that's the message of that that first advent where Jesus invades, comes out of eternity, squeezes his life into human flesh, shows us what he is like to conquer sin and death that ultimately would be conquered for all times. He would come into a conflict and we will see that one day he will bring peace. He's the only one capable of bringing peace. And out of that conflict, he asks us to join him in the bigger story that's not about the here and now. It's about sending messages to places that we will never go. Just like Joseph, we have the opportunity to send the greatest messenger, Jesus, with the greatest message the world's ever seen to places that we'll never go. Lord Jesus, You intervene for us on a regular basis and forgive us. We never give you credit for it. Gosh, forgive us for that. You, you provide and you protect. We, we never worship you as a result of that. But this morning we can correct that. By just giving you our praise to say thank you, God. That when you came, you came into our battle our mess and you're the only hope that we have Jesus came to take away your sin Jesus came to free you from all of your self imposed slavery to corruption come to Jesus ask him into your life that he forgives all your sins past present and future if you could do it on your own, you would have already done it on your own. And the fact that you haven't done it on your own is evidence that you can't. Jesus enables you to be someone that you'll never be on your own. Ask him into your heart. Put your trust in him. That he paid the penalty for your sins once for all time. And now, God, we want to worship you in our, in our tithes and offerings. And we want to worship you once again in song. And tomorrow night, Lord, what a sweet time for us to gather as families just to worship you. No strings attached. 
It's in Jesus' name that we gather together this morning. And all God's people said, amen. Ushers will take up the offering now. Please remain seated until that plate passes you by and then stand and join us. riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. God bless. You are dismissed.